power in the cross, Christ the Rosetta Stone. There is much to be said after one accepts that Baptist theology should be done with a full awareness and affirmation of one's situatedness within the complex matrices that make up social and personal life. But given the reemergence of authoritarianism and xenophobic ideologies throughout the West, movements which often enjoy Christian support, I want to spend the second part of this lecture articulating a Christologically oriented vision of power that can guide Baptists in resisting encountering these trends. Using resources in McLennan's work, I want to sketch a Baptist vision of power that is not squeamish about power talk in general, nor acquiescent to hegemonic power, but rather feeds into an anti-authoritarian understanding of power rooted in the God of Jesus Christ. This task is tricky because certain Christian theologies have bolstered the very authoritarian trends I seek to counteract. Indeed, among evangelicals in the United States, the combination of whiteness, masculinity, and Jesus has produced a particularly potent sacralization of authoritarian power that is not easily defeated. We must admit that many Christians do not compromise to support authoritarian leaders and policies, but rather find in them a genuine expression of their theological sensibilities. It's for just this reason that I think the attempt to articulate an alternative Baptist vision of power is worthwhile. It may undermine one of the roots, driving Christians anyway, to support such political programs. As such, I want to here describe McClendon's cruciform, spirit-driven conception of divine power and God's action in the world more generally. From here, I will argue that this theological conviction should guide Baptists in discerning which narratives of the city we should affirm and hook into and which we should resist. It aids us in articulating the kinds of engagement Christians should participate in that are neither controlling nor thin. Granted that we should work for goods in common, this investigation helps us name which goods are truly good. Put simply, McClendon's vision of God's power in Christ provides a theological Rosetta Stone for Christians as we inhabit the city. As is well known, McClendon situates himself within a diverse theological tradition that is neither Catholic nor Protestant, which he labels Baptist with a lowercase b. The awkwardness of this term is intentional as it names a wide-ranging group who do not neatly fit within any one expression of Christianity. For McClendon, the central marker of Baptist is their commitment to reading the scriptures as addressed to them and living in the world as a community before Jesus as teacher and Jesus as eschatological, eschatological judge. In a phrase, Baptists read as though this is that and then is now. Described thusly, Baptists cut across a variety of subtraditions, denominations, and theological inclinations. The term names a distinct and diverse way of being Christian. And while the Baptist vision is principally a hermeneutical perspective, quote, beyond that, it is a, a kind of Christian practice. It means finding in Scripture what we are to do now, God's people with an open Bible ready to follow. This perspective and practice most simply defines the distinctive theological standpoint of Baptists, end quote. Because McClendon works within this theological paradigm, his insights regarding divine power and the way these insights bleed into expressions of power in the city are similarly strange, neither Catholic nor Protestant. McClendon resists expressions of divine sovereignty that baptize the status quo or automatically identify with those in power. So too does he resist theologies that claim Christianity should focus on spiritual matters to the exclusion of political ones. Instead, McLennan sees the full expression of God's power in the peaceable life and witness of Jesus Christ. The power of God is manifest in a crucified Messiah, humiliated and penetrated by imperial might. As uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, I recommend to you Brian Robinson's book, Being Subordinate Men, Paul's Rhetoric of Gender and Power in 1 Corinthians, for a wonderful study on this. For McClendon, this conviction about Jesus 
is a master picture that should guide Christians as we navigate the world and indeed the multifaceted witness of the scriptures themselves. And while the New Testament provides us with a multiple irreducibly distinct multiple irreducibly distinct portraits of Jesus, there's no blue note that presents Jesus as the opposite of crucified and resurrected, a Jesus who takes up the sword or refrains from confronting evil and injustice in the world. As such, for McClendon, the question to ask concerning Jesus and power is not, how might powerfulness be avoided, but rather what kinds of power are in conformity with the victory of the Lamb? McClendon highlights the connection between the cross, power, and divine nature throughout his work, but perhaps nowhere with more lucidity than when he reflects upon the so-called Christ hymn in Philippians 2, 5-11. McClendon notes that many theologians interpret this passage as describing the divine pre-incarnate Christ emptying himself of divinity, not grasping after the form of God, but rather descending to earth. It is about a, quote, heavenly being who laid aside his trappings to take up human existence, end quote. Understood in this way, the passage celebrates a kind of divine saga that would be difficult to identify with or emulate. However, McClendon interprets this passage differently, though his reading is not without precedent in the Christian tradition. Following Origen and Cyprian, McClendon sees in this passage not the story of a divine emptying, thus avoiding thorny metaphysical questions about how deity could empty itself, but a way of describing the kind of power that Jesus embodied on earth. Rather than, quote, a Miltonian tale of a heavenly God who refused to rebel, McClendon sees, quote, a reference to the human Jesus's earthly temptations, which the Gospels condense into a single story that unfolds at much greater length. If we read Paul this way, he refers here to a Jesus who might have been made a king, but who instead identified himself and his cause with servants and serfs, outcasts and victims, to a degree that led the authorities to arrange his death, an outcome that is just to the cost of obeying God in this world." End quote. Read as such, McClendon sees in this short passage a beautiful expression of the kind of power that Christians should emulate, a power marked by cooperative, not motivated by selfish ambition or conceit, and kenosis, or self-emptying. It is that kind of life that is marked out as authoritative. Here is a paradoxical affirmation of the non-sovereign sovereignty of Christ that neither refuses powerfulness nor expresses power in lordly terms. It signals a divine sovereignty, a rule from below, Jesus' kingdom, in other words, is not marked by autocratic rule. It is rather a kingdom, quote, as McClendon writes, quote, a kingdom at hand, characterized by an alternative, indeed a countercultural lifestyle, one whose keynotes were expectancy, he was an eschatological prophet, openness, practicing a priest-like penetration of the barriers that divide us from God and one another, and creativity, thus disclosing himself a numinous king-in-waiting. End quote. Thus, McLennan allows Christ to color what is said about God's power more generally, and I find this instinct quite helpful. Of course, taken on their own, these theological reflections could tap into and reinforce a version of the unidirectional critique that I noted above, this time expressed through a vision of heroic martyrs unilaterally bringing light to the world through service. Additionally, any invocation of self-limitation must be a careful to avoid the criticisms brought to this concept by feminist theologians. As such, it is crucial to combine this insight about divine power and kenosis with a second affirmation, namely that the kenotic power of God is consonant with, and in fact chiefly manifest in, a communal context marked by plurality and reciprocity rather than uniformity, fear of difference, and order. God is not powerful in the way an autocratic male ruler is powerful, seeking to impose order upon difference from above in a way that hoards power and is deeply terrified of any purported disorder. Without collapsing the distinction between creator or creature, or saying more than one can, be, one can say about the divine nature, McClendon affirms a vision of God's power and God's action 
that works with and for creation, celebrating difference, diversity, and empowerment rather than tyranny. God's power is shared. God for McClendon is, of course, the beginning and end of all things, the source of ongoing blessing and strength to struggle against forces that contravene God's will. But this affirmation is coupled with an understanding of the universe as dynamic, emergent, open, and relational. Within such a world, the conviction that God is the ground of all being means that God loves, wills, and enjoys creation as interactive and unfolding, all the way down and all the way up. Paraphrasing Romans 8.28, McLennan argues that, quote, in everything as we know, God cooperates, synergizes for good with those who love God and are called according to his purpose, end quote. And so we see in McClendon resources for a theological affirmation of power that is not autocratic, but cruciform, that works in and through multiple strands in creation, rather than overwhelming it from on high. What difference does this make to Baptists seeking a theology of the city, or a way of inhabiting the city that's continent with our theological convictions? Well, throughout Europe and the United States, neoliberalism continues to dominate our political and economic landscape, privatizing everything it can and taking away even the possibility of talking about goods held in common. These forces have gone largely unchecked over the past 40 years, which coincides with a resurgence of authoritarian, xenophobic, reactionary ideologies across the West, marked in particular by heightened fear of immigrants and a desire to reclaim past glory, these movements seek control and domination of others, and insofar as they are the opposite of the form of power held up by Paul and Philippians, I don't hesitate to call them Antichrist. Baptists are in no way immune from supporting these movements. Those who do so apply the this-is-that hermeneutic, but to biblical texts like the stories of David or King Cyrus or Nehemiah, the equivalent of reading Genesis 10 through 11 as justification for apartheid, as McClendon himself pointed out, would be a problem. McClendon describes how the Baptist vision can be used in this kind of way if it is decoupled from an affirmation of Christ as the, quote, master picture, the type of types that enables one to judge between different visions of goodness, political programs, and strands within scriptures. My simple suggestion here is that if Baptists truly believe the nature of divine power is fully revealed in Christ, then we should resist movements that trade in authoritarian power. Christians are called to follow a Jesus who is our teacher and whose teaching is embedded in his learning. Christ is the sinner, as Bonhoeffer quipped. Christianity is indeed lived out, a life lived out under the governance of a central vision, as McClendon puts it. But the Christ at the center is not a stagnant or self-contained thing or principle, but a wild, canonic, and still-speaking person. In Jesus, we see a God who is the ground, not of being, but of adventure, who works synergistically with creation, and who thus funds a political imagination marked by cooperative power sharing and discerning receptivity. If this Jesus is truly guiding one's vision, then one's life will be marked by a kind of gospel instability rather than, dis than orderliness, since Jesus himself was radically open to tax collectors and zealots and even the occasional Roman, founding a community whose borders were ever-expanding, gradually calling into question all barriers humans erect for themselves in service to the liberating work of God. This community seeks to hear the presently spoken word of God, even as that word presses against the word of God spoken in the past, to again quote Willie Jennings. I would think that this would be a natural move for adherence of the Baptist vision. Baked into this hermeneutical principle is an affirmation of multiplicity and unity and difference, celebrating light that issues from many sources, as Amy Chilton and Steve Harmon have recently wrote. Indeed, McClendon's articulation of the Baptist vision is drawn from the story of Pentecost found in Acts 2, in which people are enabled to listen to each other in their native tongues. That moment, fleeting as it is, 
suggests that the movement and presence of God is marked by multiplicity and intimacy through difference. In any case, in the face of rising authoritarian movements in cities across the West, the response from Christians cannot be to avoid talk of power altogether, as if all invocations of power are equal, or as if one could simply reason one's way through the competing interests and political visions we are facing. Authoritarian answers to our crises are neither good nor Christian, but they are at least answers. They speak to the challenges we face today, even if these answers are antithetical to the gospel. They do not simply appeal to process or decorum or act as though everything is already great. Christians will either acquiesce to and support such reactionary movements or counter them with a power that is shared, organized, egalitarian, and non-coercive in principle. To organize such power is to work towards the kind of outward liberation that Bonhoeffer spoke of at the start of this lecture. And insofar as this involves working against authoritarians, it is to also work for their ultimate good, too, though they will not recognize that as such. By tying talk of power to the witness of Jesus, McClendon both reminds Baptists of a central guide in discerning how to go about this work and also points toward a more robust vision of what it might look like to, quote, seek first the kingdom of God, than, at best, vague allusions to ecclesial practice. Rather than pitting the kingdom of God against the work of justice or contrasting the former with eternal matters, one might come to see working against authoritarianism as part of what it means to pursue God's reign on earth as it is in heaven, as a way of living into what lasts rather than simply hoping for what is last. At the end of the day, what I've laid out here is primarily a negative resource for Baptists because it provides a lens through which we can name narratives and ideologies we should reject, rather than spelling out in advance precisely what our movements in the cities will look like, which I don't think that's possible. We inhabit the city with everyone else, and that is to be affirmed, but there are parts of the city that we do not enter. This willingness to say no may put us at odds with our neighbors and even our fellow Christians. It may also put us in alliance with people we thought were strangers or even enemies. But as Curtis Freeman has shown, Baptists should at least be used to playing the role of dissenters in the service of the wider health of the community. To put the matter as bluntly as I can, Baptists should not hesitate to join the fight against white supremacy, authoritarianism, and xenophobia in our cities. Our place is in the streets, and our theological reflection should follow from this action. To paraphrase a proverb that was often quoted by the recently deceased United States Congressman, civil rights leader, and Baptist minister, John Lewis, when you do theology, move your feet.